Hello everyone, I'm Danny Campbell, senior pastor here at the Tabernacle. Our service will begin in just a moment, but I want to take a moment to personally thank you for tuning in. Your time and attention are very much appreciated. I also want to personally invite you to come and visit us for our in-person 1015 worship service, the one that's about to begin, as well as our other on-campus services and activities throughout the week. We believe that nothing can take the place of in-person corporate worship and the gathering of believers. So if you're a member of the Tabernacle watching online, we welcome you back. And for those watching who are not members of any church, we encourage you to follow the Lord's leading in finding a church family, hopefully here at the Tabernacle. In the absence of being able to come physically, we're so delighted that you've joined us online and so thankful for the technology that allows us to provide this service. You can find more information about service and activity times, information about how to become a member, as well as a host of other things by checking out the website at www.thetabernaclefamily.org. Our service is about to begin, so I encourage you to use this remaining time to remove anything that may distract you, pick up your Bible, and pray that the Lord would speak to you during this service. Thank you, and God bless. Jesus, the first name that I call, let it be Jesus, my song inside the storm. Should I ever? 
ever be abandoned? Should I ever be acclaimed? Should I ever be surrounded by the fire and the flame? There's a name I will remember. There's a name I will proclaim. Let it be, let it be. I could almost see the veil peeled back and uh, uh, the heavenly choir joining in. Thank you, ladies. That was absolutely beautiful. Very touching as we get our service going here today. We're so glad to have each and every one of you here today and watching online as well. And uh, July has been a month of reading. We actually had two reading programs that happened this month, and both have been going very well. We had the Tabernacle Learning Center, which is among the very best ways to educate your preschoolers before they go into school, the other schools. Uh, they had a reading enhancement program this month with 17 readers participating, and it went absolutely great. And some of our church children and a few others have joined in in book reading through the Tabrary Church Library down the hall here. And our children so far this month have checked out 1,600 books. Goodness. And so thankful for not only the TLC, but Mary in the library providing such things. You know, um, just speaking as far as, uh, you know, education goes, there are very few things you can do that are as powerful as uh, reading with your children and uh, encouraging your children to read. And uh, those that fall behind in such things never really catch up. And so, so glad to be providing such great programs uh, here at the Tabernacle for that. I uh, want to let you know about uh, our heart's desire as a church is to get back uh, when it's appropriate to Kentuck Elementary and do a good news club after school. And we're sure hoping, we know there's a lot of uncertainty in the world and with the, this virus uh, variant going around and those things. But we sure hope that they are open to after school clubs in Pennsylvania County this year and, and in Danville also. And so to that end, we're gonna pray. We're gonna have a prayer walk at Kentuck Elementary at August 2nd at 7 p.m. Uh, and pray that the doors will open. I'm going to pray for those doors to open back up to be able to do um, the Good News Club again this year rather than take another whole year not being able to do that. We miss the children, don't we? And uh, so if you can physically come on August 2nd at 7 p.m. to pray for that door to open back up, uh, be, uh, wear comfortable walking shoes, and I presume we're just being able to walk around the outside, uh, and if uh, they let us in, we will, but uh, that's the story there. Now, on your bulletin, there is a tab you can tear out. Look at that for a second. There are several things there that you can sign up for. We also put these sign-ups at the uh, opportunity desk on this side, and if you've done that already, you don't need to do this one, but just ways to sign up there. We've got a new members class beginning August 8th. And if you are interested in that, we'd love to have you join with the others that are going to take the class this time. And then a picnic at our house on August 11th, Wednesday night at 6 p.m. And that there won't be any on-campus prayer meeting that night, so that is the, what's happening that night there. And I want you particularly to think if you're able to come to that, and you can sign up so we can prepare the drinks and everything, uh, you know, how many sodas to buy and waters to get and things like that. But I want you to particularly that night uh, think about coming ready to share a testimony with the others gathered about what God's taught you this past year during this year of uncertainty and all the things going on. Uh, we were just talking down here about how uh, it seems like just when we get our long-term plans figured out again, uh, the Lord reminds us to take it one day at a time. 
one day at a time, sweet Jesus, to be simpler people in a simpler church and uh, with our priorities as certain as ever, the gospel, the word, uh, prayer, uh, relying on the Holy Spirit, getting the gospel out to locals, locally and to the globally. And so, and then also the men's camp out, uh, which is a Friday and a Saturday. It's uh, August 13th and 14th. And it's 5 p.m. on the Friday night to 5 p.m. on the Saturday. Listen, you can come, men, uh, any time during that time. If you want to spend the night, you can. You can camp out. There's going to be some that do that. You can come. You can go back home. On Saturday, you can bring uh, boys and girls both uh, to do uh, tubing and other things. And so uh, let us know uh, if you're going to participate in that. And we'd love to have you save you a spot there. It is always great uh, throughout the year to get reports of how our mission trips have mattered and our missions giving has mattered. And we had two of those this past week that were really neat. Uh, Gary Reynolds sent me pictures of the Norway House Bible Church. Uh, Two summers ago, a team went up to uh, 10 hours above Winnipeg, Canada, uh, Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, up to Norway House, a tremendous group of indigenous people community up there uh, where our missionaries are at, and they are serving there, and we helped them build a building, and they're now worshiping in it, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, that's worth a round of applause. And then you may remember that for this past year's Christmas offering, uh, we gave over $20,000 to God's pit crew, and they took those, uh, that offering, and they did something they wanted to do. They bought commercial-grade dry vacs, fans, and dehumidifiers. And this past trip that they took down to Lake Charles, Louisiana, to the Grace Harbor uh, uh, Lighthouse Church down there, they were able to set those dehumidifiers up and a church floor that would have been ruined otherwise due to flooding was dry within 48 hours. So they could just pull up the carpet, put other carpet down. We, we basically saved a church already, you know, floor that was already happening. And God's pit crew will be able to use that in multiple places as their flooding events they respond to. And you guys did that. So give yourself a round of applause. So we rejoice with those who rejoice, and we also weep with those who weep. There is something going on in the world that you need to know about. And uh, since January 1st of this year, 3,500 of our brothers and sisters in Christ have been murdered in Nigeria. Um, The Fulani herdsman is now up to the fourth... Uh, fourth most defined terroristic group on the earth. And there are three or four different terroristic groups there competing with one another to burn churches. They've burned 300 this year, churches down. They have killed 3,500 Christians. They're kidnapping boys and girls and trying to forcibly convert them to Islam. And so whatever else you wind up praying about this week, every once in a while as the Holy Spirit reminds you about what I just said, Pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are in Nigeria. Tremendous country, one of the finest Christian countries there is right now. In fact, they uh, were the ones that gave us the great Waymaker song that was number one this past year. And um, just a tremendously growing church there. A lot of false teaching to worry about too as the gospel's going so fast there. But also these other worries, particularly in the north part of the country, And we want to be sure and pray for them as we pray. Nice to see the Parsons here this morning with us, Kevin and Jennifer and their girls there, and uh, glad to have them with us. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father, we thank you so much for meeting us in worship. We thank you for your promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst of them. And Lord, I thank you so much for how you work through the saints gathered through one another as we love you and as we love one another that's contagious to a lost world that needs you God and so Lord I pray that we'll do what the scriptures say we will lift up the name of Jesus you said if you're lifted up you'll draw people to yourself I pray you'll do that this morning thank you for that sweet worship song that was already sung to us Lord and as we enter into the time where we sing And we remember how you've answered prayer. And as we praise you, God, I pray that you would envelop this place in your presence. I think of the psalmist who said that you inhabit the praises of your people. 
I pray that you'll inhabit our praise this morning. Lord, we do pray for brothers and sisters around the world that are being persecuted, and our thoughts do turn to the church in Nigeria. We thank you that you save terrorists. You did it with the Apostle Paul. He was Saul the terrorist, and you saved him. And Lord, I pray that many of these Fulani herdsmen in Boko Haram and others that mean Christians harm and are ultimately persecuting you will have an encounter with the risen Christ. Just as you opened up heaven and revealed yourself to the Apostle Paul in a vision, I pray that will happen for them, that many will be saved. I pray you'll strengthen our brothers and sisters in Christ, that they will continue to courageously worship and witness and pray. And Lord, that you will meet them in their grief and that you'll frustrate the efforts even now being formed to do them more harm, Lord. That you help the Nigerian government be stable enough and able enough to root out this terrorism in their midst, God. We lift our brothers and sisters to you. Lord, we have many of our own challenges, God. But help us to realize we're part of something bigger than ourselves, part of the global body of Christ. And as we learn about folks like the Christians in Nigeria, Lord, may you bring them to our mind repeatedly in our prayer closets when we gather together. And may they know, even as a member told me this morning, that she felt the prayers as she was recovering from COVID. May those Christians there feel the global body of Christ lifting them up. In Christ's name we pray, amen. One thing is certain, brothers and sisters, God is good all the time. And all the time, I'm not sure you believe that. <laughs> Let's try that again. God is good and all the time, and if you believe that, you live that. On a daily basis, people see that. Even when it seems like the world is falling apart, and it is, we know that there is a good God, sovereignly in control, and he's called us to bring good news to the nations, starting right here in our Jerusalem. So I tell you what, let's sing about this good God. If you would stand with us, and Elizabeth's gonna lead us out on this beautiful song. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all
were sinners, so unworthy, still for us He chose to die. Filled us with His Holy Spirit, now we can stand and testify. That is the Worthy, I will love and hide. 
adore Him. I will bow down before Him. I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. I will love and adore Him. I will bow. I want you to pause for a moment and consider this good God that we have been worshiping and celebrating this morning. Because this this good God who invites us in for fellowship. Just think about that word. We're not talking about a howdy do as you pass in the hallway. We're talking, no, come, come in, dine with me. Sit down for a while. Share. Let me share with you, even as you share with me. That's the God that we serve, brothers and sisters. One of the ways that we do that is through prayer, isn't it? That communing with the Lord. And I think of the song that we're about to sing and just the, just the simplicity of it, no pun intended. But the joy that we have of just asking the Lord as we commune with him, Lord, strip all of this stuff away. Bring me back to the basics. I do want to come in simplicity, longing for purity. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you said that to the Lord? Lord, I long for your purity lived out through me. You know, I think sometimes we get a little bit nervous praying those prayers because we know that the Lord will answer. Just out of curiosity, just as an encouragement to one another, because the Lord tells us to sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to one another. So just as an encouragement, how many have prayed prayers like that? Lord, help me to cleanse my life. Help me to walk as you walk. Help me to have, help me to have the words that would edify brothers and sisters, not tear them down. How many have prayed those prayers and seen God answer them in your lives? And raise your hand all over. <clears throat> Praise God. That's what we're asking for in this song. That's what I want to encourage you to be thinking about. Don't just sing these words, brothers and sisters. And if, as we've said, this, this altar is open to you. If you need to do business with the Lord, you've already seen brothers and sisters come forward and do that. This is your time. So maybe the Lord's impressing on your heart something. He's, the Holy Spirit's tapping you saying, yeah, that, that, that thing that we've been working on all week, all month, all year. Give it to me now. Just come to me in simplicity. That's the invitation, brothers and sisters. All praise to this good God we serve. Let's sing it together. I come in simplicity, longing for purity, to worship you in spirit. Coming back to my first love. 
Yes, my heart will sing how I love you. And forever I'll sing, forever I'll sing. Yes, my
nations and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. I'm in an Olympic kind of mood, Brother David. Thank you for playing that. I'm going to give you a 9.8 because you stuck the landing. <laughs> How about that? Open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And as you turn there, I want to tell you this little story. My doctor of ministry came from Dallas Theological Seminary. And like you, I've been greatly blessed over the years through Dallas Seminary's professors and their graduates. Their teaching has fueled great preaching and missions efforts for nearly 100 years now. What you may not know is that shortly after Dallas Seminary was founded in 1924, it almost went bankrupt. Uh, all the creditors were ready to foreclose at noon on one particular day. And that morning, the founders of the school gathered in the president's office to pray that God would provide. And one of the ones praying that day was Harry Ironside, the great Harry Ironside. When it was his turn to pray, he said in his refreshingly candid way, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are thine. Please sell some of them and send us the money. <laughs> well, just about that time, in the outer part of the office, a tall Texan in boots and an open-collar shirt strolled into the business office. Howdy, he said to the secretary. I kind of think he looked like Mac Baldwin. Howdy. And he came in. And he said, I just sold two carloads of cattle over in Fort Worth. And I've been trying to make a business deal over there, but it, it just won't work. No matter what I try, I can't get the business part of this deal to work. And, and as I prayed about it, I feel God wants me to give this money to the seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check. And he passed the check over to the secretary. Well, she took the check, and she knew what the guys were inside praying about. And so she went to the door of the prayer meeting, timidly tapped. And Dr. Lewis Sperry Schaefer, the founder of Dallas Seminary, the president of the school, came and to the door and took the check from her hand. And he did what I would have done, too. He quickly looked at the amount that was on the check, and it was for the exact sum of their debt. Then he recognized the name on the check, and knew that the man was a cattleman, a friend of the school. And so turning to Dr. Ironside, he said, Hey, Harry, God sold the cattle. <laughs> and so the need was met. Now, what or who moved Harry Ironside to pray that way that day? And what or who thwarted the business deal of the cattleman that he intended to make? And what or who impress the cattleman to give it to the seminary instead of some other deal that he could have made. The same one who will move when you pray. The same one who will redirect you from one course of action to another. Sometimes saying no to a sin, saying yes to God's plan for your life. Sometimes saying no to good and yes to better or best, God's best for your life. And the same one who will impress upon you what you, you are to do as you go through a day. God the Holy Spirit, the God of our prayer life. Now, folks, this is the sixth message on this series we're doing called The Spirit-Filled Life. And last time we saw that the Holy Spirit is the God of our illumination. He was there when the Bible was written. He moved on the authors that wound up writing the scriptures. It is the word of God. And he's here now as we're exposed to the Bible's truth and apply it in our lives. He's the constant and today we're going to look at how he's also the God of our prayer life and how he uses the scripture, how he uses circumstances, how he directs it all to help us walk in his ways and fulfill the will of God in our lives. And it's very appropriate to follow how the Holy Spirit works through the Bible in our lives with how he uses prayer in our lives. Uh, because sometimes people separate the two. They've got their Bible study over here and they've got their prayer time over here. But the Holy Spirit wants us to bring the Word into our prayer life and He wants to bring prayer into our time of, in being in the Word. And He wants us not only to have a rich and fulfilling regular time, almost daily, 
and it should be daily, you know, but at least five, six, seven times a week where we have a time of extended time with the Lord in prayer and in the word, but also he'll bring back what we've studied to remembrance as we go through a day and help us apply the word of our life. The two are inextricably bound together. Last time I mentioned the armor of the Lord from Ephesians 6, and even this morning I woke up and as I uh, put my feet on the floor, well, I did snooze once. I did hit snooze once, but after I put my feet on the floor, I, I visualized putting on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the gospel shoes, taking up the shield of faith so I'm ready for the fiery darts of the evil one. And then there are two, not one, but two offensive things that the Lord's given us to make a difference for him in the uh, world. And it is the word of God and prayer that leads to our witness. Uh, And when I mentioned uh, from the armor of the Lord last week, I mentioned the verse from Ephesians 6 about how the Bible is called what? The sword of the spirit, right? Well, look at this verse and the next one after Ephesians 6, 17, 18. We're going to put it up here. He says, and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Then he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And right after that, he says, pray always for the body of Christ and pray always for open doors for those sharing the gospel. So uh, we've got two things that should be offensive for us in our minds, the word of God, the sword of the spirit that's going to help us go through a day with victory, but also effectual prayer, which is putting the sword and the prayer together as the Lord would have it. So the Holy Spirit uses the Bible and prayer together to advance the cause of Christ. Now, hopefully by now you found Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 is a wonderful chapter for many reasons, and I know that for some it may even be your favorite. Uh, but I wonder if, it's, if, if you've ever uh, seen how many references there are to God the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8. It's the chapter in the Bible that has the most references to the Holy Spirit by far. There are 19 references to God the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8. And so I'm going to take the time to read the entire chapter and then focus in on the implications for our spirit-directed prayer lives. So Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. 
Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. But why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren." Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, 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 in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God of our prayer life, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Romans chapter 8, undoubtedly one of the top 20 chapters in all the Bible for the tremendous truth there. Uh, We just took a bath as we read it in the knowledge of your love for us and how we read that the Spirit is praying for us and Jesus is praying for us in heaven. So the Spirit within us and Christ in heaven is praying for us and some of us are praying for one another and you want to impress on us what in a world of loss cannot be taken from us our relationship with you, our reserved place in heaven, the indwelling spirit for those that are elect and born again. Oh God, we thank you that you are working in the midst of everything we face, the good things, the bad things, the easy things, the hard things, the moments of exhilaration, the moments of disappointment. You are working in all things. You're working in us to form our character. You're working around us so that we can be in a position to glorify you. And Lord, we confess that we are weak people. And we rejoice in the fact that you meet us in our weakness, Holy Spirit. That when we don't know what words to form in prayer, you're groaning inside of us lining our hearts up with the Father's heart. And even before all that, you just want us to sit and call you Daddy. Call out to you in prayer and say, Daddy, and the Holy Spirit's helping our hearts leap within us when we think of our Heavenly Father, our adoption, our sweet elder brother Jesus. (laughs) The Lord, we're so thankful that you have a purpose and plan for each of us. Lord, as we continue this series and look at how you're the God of our prayer life, I pray that we will all be able to take it up another level in our enriching prayer life, Lord. Time of communion with you, having you with us as we go through a day. Lord, we need you. We confess it. We need you more than ever during these difficult days. And so we ask you to meet us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Last week, we uh, looked at how he is the God of our illumination and how he uses the word of God in our life. And as part of that, we talked about how he'll lead us from the word to those basic matters of obedience. Uh, We could talk about the moral law, the Ten Commands, and how he guides our mouth so that we stop lying and learn to tell truth and don't tear down but build up. And we could look at stealing and... uh, purity, sexual purity, and those things. But that was last week's message. Today we want to go right on to what this passage uh, covers with us. The first 14 verses really would have gone great with last week's message, but we're going to jump into verse 15. And we're going to look at three things, especially related to how the Holy Spirit aids us in our prayer life uh, from the middle portion of this great chapter. From verses 15 to 18, we're going to look at this. When the Spirit brings you into the presence of God, stay Another word for abide, like Jesus said, abide in me and I in you and you'll bear much fruit. I love the name for the Holy Spirit in verse 15. The spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption. I've been around enough Christians who have participated in adoption to know that it's a great act of love. And we are told that for every believer, God has a love for us where he wants to adopt us into his family. Uh, And it is so powerful when he says... The spirit of adoption is a name for the Holy Spirit. What does the spirit of adoption do? Well, in verse 15, we also learn that he helps us cry out, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit lets us know this heavenly Father is our God. He is our Father. And it is so powerful how that happens. Over there in Israel, the kids call their daddy's Abba. So uh, Jesus himself referred to the heavenly father as Abba or daddy. And here we're told that for every true believer, God, the Holy Spirit is wooing us to think of time with our daddy, the daddy who has adopted us. In verse 17, we read that we are heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Back in verse 16, we read that the spirit witnesses to a believer's heart that we're now God's kids. When you think about being a child of God, we Think about how at one time we were not. The Bible says you're either a child of the devil or a child of God. Even if you think of yourself as your own person, the Lord of your own life, the Bible says you're in deception and Satan's your real daddy. When you do the works of the devil, you're doing it because that's who your daddy is, right? But when you do the things of, that the Lord would have you do, it shows that you've been adopted by the Heavenly Father. We're in his family now. If the Gates family, Bill Gates that is, adopted a slum child from Rio de Janeiro, uh, it would be really stupid for the child the next day to be eating in the uh, trash bins around the back of the uh, mansion, right? Um, That might be what he used to do, but he doesn't have to do that anymore. Now he can come in and not only have the sumptuous meals at the Gates table, but also can have the probably even more food as he wants, you know, as he goes along. And verse 17 says, we're now heirs of God. We're joint heirs of Christ. When you think about this verse, you think about the fact that as part of God's family, we have a heritage now and we have an inheritance coming, heritage now. There are benefits to being in this family, this now 2,000 years old church family uh, that uh, has its benefits like the fact that we've got the body of Christ, we've got all these new friends, and we also have spiritual gifts that the Lord gives us, and we have that reserved place in heaven, heritage now, inheritance coming. Well, do you see what's happening here? The Spirit leads us into the presence of our Heavenly Father. And he wants us to spend time with God, loving him because he's our daddy, appreciating our role as his children, opening and using the gifts or the presence that he gives us. Galatians 4, 6, Paul says it again there. He says, because you are his sons, God has sent forth the spirit of son, his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Now, this is key. One of the reasons the Holy Spirit is inside of you And inside of me as a believer is so that we will cry out to our Father in prayer. This is one of those key teachings there. God has sent forth the Spirit of the Son into your hearts crying out, Abba, Father. Now think about Christmas time here. And let's make it a south side Christmas. The family's together and there's joy in each other's presence. You're the teenage child and a gift has been given to you. It's a new gun so you can go out hunting with Daddy. And you light up when you get it, and your dad lights up at the, in the joy you have for receiving it. Then dad says, listen, I know it's Christmas Day, but the work around here just never stops. So I've got to go out and clean up the brush pile. I just have to do it. After I'm done with that, I'll come back in. And then, son, we'll go over the proper uh, 
uh, use and care of your gift, the gun, and then I'll take you out to hunt with it. And you say, well, Dad, can I come out and help you with that brush pile? That'll make that go faster. And then we can get back in here faster, and then we can go out and use the gift faster, right? And he says, I would love it. I'd greatly appreciate your help, son, if you'll do that. And all along the way, as you go through those diff three different things, you know, going out to do the work uh, that has to be done, uh, take, getting instruction on how best use the gift, and then going out and actually use it, in all those ways, you're also spending time with your daddy as you do that, right? You're making memories. You're learning stuff you don't know. You're getting stuff done. And the Holy Spirit works in you like that as you spend time in God's presence. Not only the moments of quiet, the quiet time, somewhere where you live, or maybe you have a work situation where you can pull aside for a few minutes there. Uh, for many people, it's first thing in the morning. Others, you have a new baby and there's no way you can beat the baby up. And so when the baby uh, gets up, you take care of the baby. And then maybe during nap time, that's when you have your energizing time with the Lord. For others, it's during your lunch break. Others, it's in the evening time before you go to bed. Most people in here are already spending 30 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, two hours on social media or watching TV or other things. And you can carve that time out and instead spend time in the Word of God and in prayer. So not only is it that time, but it's also as you go through the day, remembering the Holy Spirit, bringing to remembrance what you've learned and applying it as you go through a day. And this constant is there. As far as that prayer room, I love what Jesus says in Matthew 6.6. 6, when you pray, go into your room. And when you've shut your door, pray to your Father who's in the secret place. It's become the secret place. When I think of secret place, I think of two lovers going to a secret place to meet, right? And God calls your prayer time that. It's just you and me. Come in. It's me and you. I'm going to woo you there with my love, and we're going to develop our relationship. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And frankly, just being with the Father is its own reward. And the Spirit is crying out for you. He's working within you to say, I miss that time with God. I want that time with you, believer. And you pull in and have it. When the Spirit brings you into the presence of God in prayer, stay a while, abide a while. What if that boy getting the Christmas gift abruptly said to his dad, Thanks, Dad. I'm not really interested in helping you get done what you need to do. So I'm just going to take the gift you gave me and go play with my friends. And uh, that'd be an ungrateful child, wouldn't it? And that's how we often are with God. Yeah, God, thank you for what you do, but I don't really want to spend time with you. I mean, you're going to talk to me about stuff I don't really want to talk about. You know, I've got my own plan for my life, and so I'll just do that instead of spending time with you. Well, you get the point there. A lot of us get out of our time of prayer way too quickly, and for many people listening to my voice now, it's been weeks. It's been months. It's been years. It's been never have you gone beyond a profession of faith and a public commitment in baptism and joining a church. This may even be true of some of our leaders. It may be true for folks that go into the ministry. It may be true for missionaries. They've read the Bible and they've heard sermons preached. They know what to do, but they, it's been a long time since you've had an energizing personal time with the Lord that God wants to be a foretaste of heaven that we have now, even as we get ready for then. Let me recommend you finding that at least 30 minutes in prayer. Uh, and uh, during that time, let me encourage you to start it with intaking scripture somehow. When you're reading in the Old Testament, a chapter. When you're reading in the Gospels, a section. When you're reading in the letters, a paragraph. That's usually enough there because it's so dense with commands and things. But you start with about 10 minutes of reading, asking the Holy Spirit to guide you. It's you listening to God because he speaks through his word. He wants to form the way you think. He wants to form his relationship with you through the love letter that he's written you that is the Bible. And that will be more evident in some passages than other passages. But as you take it in uh, with a humble spirit before the Lord saying, teach me, he will use that time. So you're listening to God to speak through the passage. And what I like to recommend is beginning your time of praying by praying the scripture you've just intaked back to the Lord for yourself first and then for your immediate family, your friends, 
and then every situation that you know of as it comes to your mind. And you want to write down the things that are impressed on you during that time. I've often found that if I keep on track with the time and the prayer and uh, with the scripture intake, I'm hearing from God, I'm praying to God. I'm also praying in a rounded way for my family. If you pray through the book of Ephesians that way, the Holy Spirit one day is going to impress on you things related to anger. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So you're praying for yourself and everybody you know that's got an anger problem. There's things in there about speech. You're going to pray about your own speech and the speech of those that you are, interact with in the world. And then you're going to get to a passage that says... Uh, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So you can pray for everybody you know that's got an issue with addiction or something like that and that they'd uh, more and more have be flushed of sin and filled with the Spirit. When I say write down things that are impressed on you, many times it, we view it as a distraction. Something comes into your mind that you're supposed to do later that day. And what I found, if I just take the time to jot on a 3 by 5 card or in a little piece of paper on the side, many times the five things I really need to do that day, including people I need to call, are my itinerary is already there so I leave that time of prayer and I go out and I call somebody that I haven't called in two months because their name came to my mind during that prayer time and it's God's perfect timing for when they needed to hear from me now before we make the next point look at verses 18 through 22 again because it's got one of the most amazing concepts in here I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Verse 20, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. The trees, the ground, subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected in hope. Verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know, verse 22, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first of the spirits. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. He talks here about the future time. Acts 3, Peter called it the restoration of all things. When there will be a new heavens and new earth and believers will have a new body and live on that new earth, sin won't be there, sorrow won't be there. What will be is a perfect earth and glorified people on that earth walking with God. And every believer as they meditate that says, Meditate on that says, I can't hardly wait for that. That's going to be so neat to have the best things of earth without the sin. But the trees and the ground are also aching because our sin has messed up the world, right? We pollute the world. We mess it up in different ways. And that time will stop and it won't be visible there on the new earth. So creation aches and groans. And I love how poetically the Holy Spirit had Paul write this we ourselves are also groaning and not only is creation groaning for that better day believers are burdened about the effects of sin in our lives in our world I hope as you go through a day and you see things in yourself that are not what you want to have in your life the sins that shouldn't be there I hope that as your relationship with the Lord go, grows you're groaning inside oh how can that wicked way be in me? How can that thing be in me? I don't want that anymore, Lord. That characterized the old Danny. I don't want that to be part of the new Danny you say that I am now. There ought to be a groaning. There ought to be an anxiety. There ought to be a burdening of your heart for that which should not be. And getting real and honest with ourselves about that before God in our prayer time, but also as we pray with others, getting real and honest before them. Oftentimes that humility will allow God to work in mighty ways in your midst. And so from verses 23 to 27, we see when the Spirit burdens you to pray for someone or something, pray, pray. As we spend time with God in prayer, as we're reading our Bible and thinking about our lives, our family and friends, our schools, our workplaces, our communities, and our nation, there will be much that makes us groan. Oh God, there's so much in me. There's so much in my family. There's so much in my church. There's so much in my city. There's so much in my county. There's so much in my state. There's so much in my country. There's so much in my world that's not as it should be. And you ought to groan in prayer before the Lord for that. Verse 23 presents the thinking believer as groaning inside themselves, aching within, burdened that things are not as they should be in their own life and in the world. And I don't know about you, but when I'm down like that, 
There is nothing cooler that happens than an old friend calling or a new friend stopping by or someone in the body of Christ you don't know but you respect coming alongside you and saying, hey, is everything okay? And all of a sudden you have a chance to talk with someone. Doesn't it mean a lot when somebody comes alongside of you like that and listens to your story or if you can't even form words, you're so upset they just sat with you a while? Doesn't that mean the world to you when that happens? (laughs) Folks, verse 26 says the Spirit is that kind of friend to us, praying for us with groans that cannot be uttered when we ourselves don't know how we ought to pray as we ought. Mm. I confess there's much in my life I don't know how to pray for as I ought. And sometimes it's just groans. God, I have two boys that we dearly love. We poured ourselves into them. We spent over $100,000 getting them to a Christian school. They were part of our WANA program and our youth group. And they're far from you right now. They are far from you. I pray for revival in their life. But I don't even know how to pray after that. I know sometimes it straight takes extreme things, great pain, great suffering to get somebody's attention. And on one hand, I don't want them to go through painful things, hard things. So I want to pray, do whatever it takes, Lord, but I don't know if I want you to do whatever it would take because that could mean a lot of things. But whatever it takes would be better than them if they're not saved, going to hell. And if they are saved, just continuing to dishonor you the way they are and point others the wrong direction. (laughs) I don't know how to pray. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. Some of you have had that even this past year. God, my mom and my daddy was so sharp. Now they're just a shell of themselves. And it doesn't look like they're going to come back and ever be what they were. There they are dying. And Lord, what I really want is you to heal them. I want to be in a perfect body and them be in a perfect body and us have forever together. Thank you, Lord, their promises that's coming because they know you and I know you. But, Lord, if, if they can't come back and be as healthy as they were, then, then Lord, don't let them suffer. Go ahead and take them to be with you. I mean, you're actually praying that they'll go ahead and pass from this life because you don't want them to suffer anymore. How can you pray that? It's hard to pray, isn't it? It's a groan. We don't know how to pray for as well. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings. We can't even form the words in times like that. And thank God that when we just pour it out before the Lord and humble ourselves before him, he takes the groanings and he takes those And does what our beautiful God can do. Look at verse 27. Verse 27 says, He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He's searching our heart. He knows what God's will is. And we can pour it out to him. And he'll give us his peace. He'll give us his presence even when we're still just tore up from the floor up about it. So when God's Spirit burdens you to pray for a person or a matter, this is, that is how we should pray for them, for it. Now let's do make one thing clear here. God will never give a true believer peace about disobeying a biblical command. So a believer you know comes up to you and says, pray that I'll have peace about marrying, and then they give you the name. And they're a Christian, and the other person's a non-Christian. Pray I'll have peace about marrying them. And in your mind and heart you say, well, I I love you, but I can't pray for that. Because 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, believers are not to be unequally yoked with non-believers. And you won't have true peace about disobeying God. Now, God is a God of grace and sometimes does save the non-Christian in that marriage, 
but there are so many stories of lifetime heartache for every conversion that there is. And so we pray for others, but we don't want to pray against the explicitly revealed will of God. And when we get the chance, we want to tell people about that too. And again, God is great. He can move after the fact. Uh, but if God says it's wrong, we need to humbly admit that to him, receive his forgiveness, and go on with him. Well, that may be your situation. And, and you're like, well, Danny, I blew it, you know, but, uh, you know, but I love that old boy. I love that old girl. And uh, God can use you in that relationship. He tells believers in another passage to stay in that marriage in hopes that they'll come to know Christ and that your character might be the difference in that. But hear me well. Anytime you can identify, and the Spirit helps you identify from the Scriptures, something that you were in sin to be a part of, a business relationship, uh, any decision that was ungodly like that, you do have to confess that as sin to the Lord. Now, if a child was born, you're not saying the child is a sin because God is beautiful. Every new life coming in is his plan and his will somehow, you know. But you do need to confess the sin as sin that led to that happening, even as we rejoice and the church comes alongside and helps every born person come to become a born-again child of God, right? But for your own sake, you'll always have a distress until you get right with God about the things that were sin in your life. The Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God, and we need to intercede for ourselves and others that way. Psalm 139 says it so well. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, this is where it's so beautiful because there's a triangulation that goes on. You got the word, you got prayer, you got the Holy Spirit. And there's this triangulation going on. The Holy Spirit using the word, using the prayer. Uh, the Spirit knows the Word. The Spirit knows what's best for you. The Spirit knows what's best for the person you're praying for. And as you pray for yourself and others, the Holy Spirit guides those prayers and makes them effectual for the advancement of God's kingdom on earth. Let me say, when he impresses someone on your heart, do stop and pray for them. If it's the middle of the night and you are being led to pray for somebody, stop then and pray for them. Pray uh, concertedly for them. It may be a missionary on the other side of the world and you don't know what they're going through in that moment. Maybe later on you'll get to hear about something that happened at that exact same moment. Those are some of the great things in life when we hear about how God put those prayers together. There are closed access places missionaries can't get to, but guess what? Our prayers can go where we cannot. Brother Andrew said that our prayers go where we cannot. Brother Andrew. And that's why on the back of your notes, I've given you several ways to pray for the persecuted church, also unreached people groups and less reached nations and things like that, and missionaries serving them. And you ought to take up those opportunities to be a concerted prayer. Let me just quickly talk about fasting as part of this. Fasting as part of this. So people wonder about fasting and how it connects with prayer. In Matthew 6, Jesus promised a blessing for going into your prayer closet. He also promised a blessing for prayer. It says, uh, for fasting, God will reward it. Fasting is connected with prayer, right? And so what we do is we spend a lot of time getting food and consuming food. And when we're called to fast, what we're doing is we're setting aside the time procuring and the time eating uh, for prayer during that time. So instead of going an hour somewhere, if God calls you to do a fast for a lunch... You miss lunch, and not only do you take that time and pray instead of going to eat somewhere, then you also, when there's rumbly in your tumbly before dinner time, you're remembering to pray for the same thing that you were praying for, the person, the thing, the event, etc. Now, there's a lot of garbage out there about fasting. There really is. Let me tell you just quickly about fasting. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah all did a 40-day fast in the Bible. Um, and every once in a while, you'll see a super spiritual church out there somewhere say, we're going to enter in a 40-day fast for our people. You know, everybody's supposed to fast for 40 days. Um, let me tell you about what I see in the scriptures. Most of the fasts were missing one meal, maybe a day of food, so they could pray about something. The longest corporate fast for praying was three days. 
Everybody fasting together at the same time. Esther had a serious thing to do, and she asked the people, the Jews, to pray because she was going to go before the king, and they fasted. The whole nation of Jews was fasting for three days for that. There's a couple times there's a seven-day fast, but it was because of mourning. They didn't feel like eating. They were so devastated by the loss of their king or the loss of their person. Um, and so that's pretty much it. There are a lot of fasts where they missed one meal, missed some meals during a day to focus in on prayer. And so what I'm asking you to do is, if you do longer than a day or two, you want to talk to a doctor about it. But you will every once in a while want to say, okay, I'm really burdened to pray about my prodigal child. I'm burdened to pray about this. I'm burdened to pray about that. So I'm going to pick Thursday or Friday somewhere in there. I'm going to fast through lunch and maybe fast through breakfast and lunch that day or something like that. And every time there's that rumbly in your tumbly, uh, you know, pray in a concerted way. And let me advise the power of personal prayer retreats where you do take a half day off, three, four hours at a time, and you go to the Lord praying that whole time about one matter and how the Lord can give you clarity in that. Pray regularly for the big burdens presented in the Bible. Um, the conversion of the Jewish people, the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for souls and soul winners, for suffering believers, and return of Jesus. Uh, Many of those are the groans that we see in scriptures, the anxiety prayers of scriptures. Paul said, please pray for me as I go and try to win the next people group to Jesus. There are many people out there that want to do me harm. Pray, pray, pray. Well, the final point we want to make is from verses 27 to 28. When the Spirit impresses on you a course of action, obey. In verse 27, we learn that the Spirit will make intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Then there's that great promise in verse 28. All things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. We don't always understand what God's doing in our lives, particularly as we face the very difficult things. But God the Holy Spirit does, and he leads us. A child looks at the back of grandma's quilt and just sees a mess. Stitches here and stitches there, you know, but then grandma turns it around and it's a unified whole, right? And that's how we are as we look at the back of things uh, that God's doing. One day we'll get to see the front side and how the beautiful quilt's been put together by the Holy Spirit. As we spend time with God, the Holy Spirit's going to impress on us things that he expects us to do. And you say, Danny, when this has happened to you, did you hear an audible voice? No. It was louder than that. And many of you know what I mean. As you've prayed about a matter, God's peace is settled on you, and you know this is the course of action you are to take. Let's look at a couple examples in the book of Acts. Turn there. Acts 13. Acts 13. Not only does this happen for individuals as they pray and families as they pray together, husbands and wives and and their families praying together, but also when churches come together in prayer and Sunday school classes. Acts 13, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Prayer here is called ministering to the Lord. How's your prayer ministry going? And fasted. The Holy Spirit said... Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. The church at Antioch said, we want to do something about the lostness that's out there in the world. And so they came together and prayed, God, what would you have us do? And he said, I want to take the two best guys you got there and send them to people that have nothing. They can't pay for a preacher. They can't pray for a witness. You're going to pay for it. You're going to send them out. You're going to help them get going. You're going to pray for them as they go. And all of a sudden, the missionary movement began that completed the rest of the book of Acts. Folks, God will give his peace to those who say yes to his call in their lives. But God will disturb the peace of a believer who is not making the best choice for them. Acts chapter 16. Let's see an example where the Holy Spirit didn't say go, but he said not there. Another place instead. Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. It says, when they had gone through Fergia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go in Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. 
So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia, that's Europe, and help us. After we had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So there Paul was praying. He had reached the bottom part of Galatia. He wanted to turn back and go to the northern part of Galatia, which was Asia Minor. He wanted to complete the set, you know, to get the gospel and the churches all throughout there. And so he said, okay, Lord, I got my bags packed. I'm ready to go. I'm willing to go. But Lord, uh, okay, I'm ready to go. And, And somehow he had a depression in his spirit, not there. And he said, not there. That's my heart's desire. I want to reach people in Asia, Asia Minor. And the gospel go that way. And he tried it again. The Lord said, nope, not that way. And instead, then he had a vision and went over to Europe instead. This was good. And by God's grace, others like Peter were sent there to reach those folks. But for Paul, he was supposed to go this way, which actually is great for us because this way meant up to Europe. And Europe meant later over to America and our generations, right? Um, But the Spirit said no. You know what's neat about how even when God tells you no, he'll remember what your heart's desire was? Do you know who Paul's first convert was when he wound up in Europe instead of Asia Minor? A lady, a businesswoman from Europe. And because of her tie, she probably went back there and helped things get going in Thyatira in the area that Paul had wanted to go to and God had redirected him. So not only did he take the gospel into Europe and Greece and all the other ways that wound up being, but also his heart's desire. When you say yes to God, the Holy Spirit, one day you'll understand that God was working for your good. But you can't get around the fact that sometimes as you lay a matter before the Lord, he just says no. And that impression is so strong on you that you know it would be disobedience to go forward. You need to have that kind of prayer life with the Lord. One of our members told me that after high school, he was impressed by the Holy Spirit to go to Liberty University. And for many years, he wondered, why did I go to Liberty University? I didn't turn into a preacher and uh, just had a hard working life in Danville, Virginia. Then one day, when he was thinking about it, the Holy Spirit gave him his answer years later. The Holy Spirit said, I had to get you away from that girl you were so obsessed with in high school. So I brought you to Liberty. Then I brought you back home. And then you married the sweetheart you're supposed to marry. And your kids and grandkids are here serving Jesus today because of that. The Lord works in mysterious ways. So here's the practical ramification. Never say yes to something before praying about it and having the green light from God. Whether as an individual or whether as a family or whether as a Sunday school class and church, always make sure you've got God's peace about a direction. He will put checks in your way. Sometimes those are circumstantial. Sometimes that's just an absolute pit in your stomach saying, no, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do something else instead. Back in 2003 and 2004, we had a lot of conflict at the church in uh, Waynesboro. And um, a revivalist came through and he said, hey, Danny, Man, I know a church in Tennessee that's got your name all over it. Give me your resume. I'll put it in there, and I'll go to that church, and we'll have you pastoring over there before you know it. And I said, well, Bob, I have to pray about that. And I prayed about it. And God, the Holy Spirit, says, no, sir. He said, no, sir, to me. Don't you put your resume in. You withstand this time of conflict here in this church. You give them what they've never had before, a long-term pastor. And I am so glad it worked out that day. Now... 2015 or so, two friends of mine wanted to submit my resume here. And I prayed about it, and God gave me the freedom to pursue it in a way I hadn't had back in 2003 and (laughs) 4. So I said yes, and I'm glad I said yes, and I'm glad to be here. Listen to me, young folks. The sooner you learn this lesson, the better off you're going to be. After I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit convicted me about dating. It had been too much of an obsession in my life. So he led me to a commitment not to date anyone for at least, seriously for at least a whole year. I went out on double dates and things like that, but didn't commit to, uh, to serious dating at all during that year. And I grew like wildfire. I'm so glad I said yes at that time. In college, 
uh, as a junior, he impressed on me not to play soccer that junior year. I've told this story before, but what a year of growth it was for me. I grew like wildfire, and I knew that Jesus was more important to me than anything else, including what had been idolatrous to me in the past, soccer. At the end of that year, he gave it back to me. I got to play my senior year, my best year ever, and what a year it was, and he's been giving it back in many different ways over these last 30 years. Folks, won't you commit now to letting the Holy Spirit be the God of your prayer life, to be led by the Holy Spirit, informed by his word as you pray, and watch what he does, even if it takes years to understand, and you might not understand till glory. Go ahead and bow your heads. Go ahead and stand up. I'm going to close us in prayer here. I'm going to pray for you. And if part of what the Holy Spirit wants you to do is come to me after the service and talk to me about salvation, I'd be glad to do that with you today. Or about surrender of some area to your life to God. Or some other area that you're burdened with. I'll be glad to set with you and groan with you. God, I thank you for these dear people who have heard me today. I thank you for the word of God. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you use the word in our prayer time to make God's truth come alive inside of us, to give us clear guidance not only on the things that are clear in your scriptures, but also those subjective matters of should we choose between this option or that option. Thank you for the burdens you give us, Lord, the groans that you give us to pray about things even when we aren't even sure to pray. It is so comforting to know that you're with us in that moment. Lord, somebody within the hearing of my voice has a heavy heart, a very heavy heart. God, I pray that if they got nothing out of this message, they'll know they can pour out their heart to you and you'll meet them in that moment of prayer. We praise you, God, that you are growing this relationship between you and us. Help us this week to see your hand at work as we submit to it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you. Well, folks, thanks again for tuning in. Your time and attention were so very much appreciated, and we pray that this service was a blessing to you. This live stream will soon be available on our social media platforms, including our Facebook page at The Tabernacle Family and our YouTube channel, The Tabernacle Today, The sermon from this service will also soon be posted on your podcast platforms at The Tabernacle Today, as well as on our website, www.thetabernaclefamily.org, and our mobile app. If you're searching for a church home, we would love for you to join our church family. Also, I want you to know that God has a purpose and plan for your life, and if we can help you grow in any way, feel free to contact us by visiting us in person calling our church office, sending us an email or text, or by visiting our social media platforms where you can find plenty of online resources. We want to help you grow in any and every way possible. God bless you this week, and we hope to see you soon. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you.